In the early morning hours of October 4, 2002, four men, as well as others who had attended a house party in the quiet Newark, California suburb, took part in the slaying of a 17-year-old girl. They would beat, strangle, and eventually kill this woman for the crime of trying to cope with something that most of us cannot imagine, being born in the wrong body. This murder would raise a rallying cry to many in not just our state, but all over the nation, that the violence against trans people was not acceptable and something had to change. On this episode of California True Crime, we look at the brutal slaying of Gwen Arejo and the firestorm set off by her death that led to political changes that would make it harder for others to hide behind the trans panic defense and make our state a little safer for everyone. This is the murder of Gwen Arejo on California True Crime. Welcome to another episode of California True Crime. I'm Charles, and I'll be leading you through this case. With me, you know them, Sean and Jessica. How are you guys doing? I'm doing good. I'm good. I'm excited to finally find out about this case. Yeah, it's actually going to be, um, this is, I think for me, it was one of the more difficult cases I've looked into because of a lot of, well, we'll get, it, we'll get into it. There's a lot of stuff that goes on with this, with this case, um, a lot of backstory and history that I think is going to be interesting, um, maybe new for some people, but um, we're going to talk about maybe it might be some kind of difficult topics. So um, I think it's going to be a good one for us. Which is a good warning, I think, for our listeners on these. It'll be five episodes, right? Yeah, we're going to uh, cover five episodes. Uh, we're actually going to talk about some background on uh, the victim's life, Gwen, uh, where she's from, uh, her family life, and some of the issues that she was dealing with, as well as some of the important history that you should know going into the story about California and its relationship with the struggle for trans rights. We'll then, uh, in episode two, we'll talk a lot about the murder and what happened. We'll go into, actually, this is the first time I can think of that we actually have some information from the juror's perspective. We actually have some research done about the jury selection and the trial. We'll cover that. And then um, our last episodes will be focused around the ramifications and the fallout from this case. But we will be dealing with some difficult topics. We'll be dealing with murder as well as rape. And I think that might be triggering for some people because you have a lot of detail that we're going to go into. Yeah. And we'll, we'll call it out before we get there, but this may be an episode you want to make sure that you're listening to somewhere that's maybe not on a big speaker or you might not want to listen to this episode with if you if you have young kids or young kids around. So on that note, had either of you guys heard about this case before we started? I always like to start with that question. I hadn't. And it's it's strange because I was living in the Bay Area at this time and I don't know why somehow I missed this one. Yeah, I had not. I've heard of similar cases, but this one I actually had not. Uh, the same for me. Actually, uh, this, this case was actually re- uh, suggested to us by one of our listeners via Twitter. So again, we're always uh, willing to talk about cases or if you're interested in getting in touch with us, you can always email us at Cali true crime at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter uh, at Cali true crime or Instagram. So if you're interested to continue this discussion, you can also join our Facebook group. We have a, a discussion group on Facebook that we post up information about the cases uh, and um, recently, and if you've been following on our website, we do now have a blog as well um, that goes over some of our cold cases, some background on some of the things that we didn't necessarily talk about in the episodes. So um, feel free to stop by and check that out as well. Like some of our other cases, uh, this particular case had a lasting impact on our state's legal system and laid a lot of the groundwork for other states to follow in the fight for equality and for bringing justice to people in need. So again, I think this is a, an important case to talk about. This case deals with the killing of 17-year-old Gwen Arejo. She was a trans woman living in Newark, California. Since this case deals with some of the issues that might be new to people or unfamiliar, we want to get some things clear from the start. I'll be talking about Gwen using her preferred pronoun, which is uh, her and she. We'll be talking about her early life before she started to transition. Uh, This is an issue 
that more and more people are coming to terms with as the issue of trans rights are being talked about uh, more and more in mainstream media. But this is not our story, and we want to talk about it with the seriousness that it deserves while being as respectful as possible. As with all the episodes in the series, my information will be cited on our website, CaliforniaTrueCrime.com, with the majority of the information being taken from local newspapers of the time, the Mercury News, as well as the East Bay Times. At this point, to kind of set the stage, we'd like to talk a little bit about some of the um, issues that face trans individuals in our society. And Jessica, you have some statistics and information about particularly violence against trans individuals? I do, yeah. Um, I got this information from three different sources. The first is a 2015 survey of transgender individuals in the United States. It covered about 28,000 people. And this was done by the NCTE, or the National Center for Transgender Equality. I also got some information from the Human Rights Campaign, as well as the Anti-Violence Project. So I will make sure and link all of those things. The 2015 survey is very massive and encompassing, covers a lot of different issues, and it's really interesting. So I would urge a lot of people to go and look at that. Before I give you the statistics, the specific ones I have are on violence suffered by transgender people. I want to tell you that it is difficult to get these statistics in part because there are a lot of obstacles to people coming forward and even letting the police know about crimes. In that 2015 survey, for instance, it said that 57% of people surveyed felt uncomfortable asking the police for help. And according to the Anti-Violence Project, transgender people were 3.7 times more likely to experience police violence compared to cisgender survivors and victims. And we've seen this with a couple of other things that we've talked about, you know, the kids who are molested and hurt. If people don't feel comfortable coming forward to the police, then we don't know that things are happening. We can't count them in statistics. So everything I'm about to give you is probably an undercounted number. So it's even though it's bad, it's probably much higher than this number I'm going to give you. Another obstacle in the collection of those statistics is people having an accurate ID so that when something happens to them, police can take their information We saw this in several of the cold cases that we looked up. We had trouble finding some for these uh, episodes because people's ID don't have their correct name or their correct gender on them. A lot of that is changing, but in the 2015 survey, it found that only 11% of people had ID that matched their preferred name and their preferred gender. In California, it's actually much easier than in a lot of states to get that changed. You don't need a court order. There's a document that will link for anybody who's interested in having that changed, but it still costs money, which can be really difficult for a lot of people. You might have to take time off of work to go down to DMV. The other thing that California has done, and a lot of states are moving in this direction, is as of 2019, on the form when you get your driver's license, you can choose male, female, or a third category uh, that says non-binary gender option. So hopefully these will be situations that are fixed in the future, but until then, a lot of the cold cases we have are cases that we're going to talk about. The issue is the legal name. So the statistics I got came from mainly from the 2015 survey. These are just, I just kind of focus on violence right here. 46% of transgender people said that they were verbally harassed for being transgender in the past year. 47% were sexually assaulted at some point in their lifetime. 54% experienced violence at the hands of an intimate partner. And according to the Anti-Violence Project, transgender women were 1.8 times more likely to experience sexual violence. And of all of the murders committed that were motivated by hate, so the legal definition of hate, you were murdered because you were a woman, some distinguishing characteristic because of your gender, because of your sexuality, your ethnicity, or your race. Of all of those that happened in 2013, 72% of those happen to transgender women. And these are statistics that get worse for transgender individuals of color. According to the Human Rights Campaign, in 2019, there were 27 deaths of transgender or non-conforming people in the U.S., and the majority of those victims were Black transgender women. So again, these statistics are very very scary. I know we hear a lot about violence, um, the violence faced by transgender individuals, But it's really important to note that these are probably low numbers compared to what's actually happening. And we want to start with along those lines with the definition of transgender. If you're not familiar or you might 
have an idea of what that term means. Um, according to the glad.org from an article reporting on transgender victims of violence. So this was from a, a glad web article for people writing about transgender individuals, men and women that have experienced violence, that according to their site, quote, transgender is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. Transgender people may or may not decide to alter their bodies hormonally or and or surgically. A person's medical history has no bearing whatsoever on whether or not they should be considered transgender. The word transgender is an adjective and should never be used as a noun or should it have the ED at the end. A person signed male at birth but who lives as a woman is a transgender woman. A person assigned female at birth but who lives as a man is a transgender man. Unquote. There's a long and interesting history of the struggle for equal rights. One of the major movements in this history doesn't take place here in California, but instead happens in New York City and stands as a flashpoint in the fight for LGBTQIA rights, and that's the Stonewall Riot. And that's named for the Stonewall Inn, a popular night spot for the LGBTQIA community in the 1960s. And this was one of the site this was a site of a riot on June 28th, 1969, which lasted for 2 days. And and really, this is seen by a lot of people that it becomes a spark that's going to fan the flames of revolution throughout the United States. But what's interesting is once you start digging into the history, this is not the first time that people would stand up for the rights against an oppressive government or the prejudice or bias of public scorn that was rife at the time when dealing with these kinds of issues. No, some of, in fact, some of the earliest struggles in this fight were right here in California. Susan Stryker, professor of gender and women's studies, uh, also former director of the Institute for LGBT Studies and the founder of the Transgender Studies Initiative at the University of Arizona, has said, quote, Stonewall was more like the crest of a wave rather than the beginning of a wave. In fact, in an article that was run in the Berkeley Barb, an underground newspaper congratulated New York City for, quote, joining the revolution, unquote. In California, there are protests at the Black Cat Tavern on Sunset Boulevard in L.A. in 1967, a riot at Compton's Cafeteria, which is an all-night diner in the Tenderloin in San Francisco in 1966. And, And before that, there was also a riot in L.A.'s Cooper Donuts in 1959. There were the Daughters of Belitis, a lesbian organization formed in San Francisco in the early part of the 1960s. There was even actually a gay magazine called Vice Versa, which was started in L.A. in 1947. And on looking up this magazine, there was a great quote from one of the readers, like in the back of the magazine. And the quote reads, uh, quote, it seems like such a courageous uh, venture, though perhaps not a very wise one. Unquote. And so this is a long time before Stonewall. And I bring these up because these are issues about human rights and the fight for those goes back a lot further than we sometimes think. I also bring these up because in many of these cases, if not all of them, trans people are at the center and in some cases leading these fights. But oftentimes their contributions, like many marginalized people, have been pushed to the edge of history and often overlooked or denied. It is important to remember that the histories of these struggles are far broader and more complex than sometimes gets reported, and that we need to be better at representing the true history of these stories. As a writer Ryan Cross said in his article about the history of the LGBTQIA struggle for civil rights, quote, The point, then, in opening history up isn't to diminish a moment so much as reveal others, unquote. Which brings us back to the case that we're covering here. This is a story about a young woman that is struggling with something that most of us will never really understand, and that struggle is against people's unwillingness to treat her as somebody, and this is something that will lead to her death. That is the tragedy here for many of us, is that this death, like so many more, could have been avoided if somebody had made a different decision. Now, before we go on uh, any of the story, we'd like to give you a little background on where this story takes place. Sean, you have some information for us on Newark, California? Yeah, uh, Newark is a city in Alameda County, which is the same county as Oakland. 
It is around 38 miles southeast of San Francisco and is east across the bay from Palo Alto. Interstate 880 serves as it, its eastern boundary with Fremont. So it's, it's pretty much south Bay Area. It's even south of the San Mateo Bridge, if that helps anyone who might not be super familiar with the area. It was uh, incorporated as a city in September 1955, and Newark is surrounded by the city of Fremont. The three cities of Newark, Fremont, and Union City make up the Tri-City area. Its population was 42,573 in the 2010 census, making it the third largest city in the U.S. named Newark after Newark, Ohio, and Newark, New Jersey. Um, Newark was named after Newark Castle, Port Glasgow in Scotland by J. Barr Robertson, who in 1872 bought out the original owner of the land, a man named J. Ross Brown. So everyone was just named J. back then, I guess, who, (laughs) who himself was a secret agent for the United States, became an ambassador to China, as well as a friend of Mark Twain. Uh, Because of the completion of the railroad this brought more industry and development uh, to the new town such as the salt industry the leslie salt company was set up it set up shop and remains there today as the cargill salt company which currently operates a large salt refinery in newark which clean cleans solar salt produced in salt evaporated ponds in the san francisco bay and that's science i know nothing about so if there's any there's any salt scientists that want to explain a little more? I was kind of excited to hear that because I didn't know we had solar evaporators that were that close to us. And I'm kind of excited. I'd like to know if they give tours. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. So uh, the city houses uh, the New, Work- New Park Mall, which I love malls. I would drive by this mall on the 880 when I lived in the Bay Area to head to Dave and Buster's in Milpitas, since that was the closest Dave and Buster's uh, at the time. The electronics company Logitech uh, is also there providing jobs to the community. The city of Newark has 13 parks and sport play facilities. Uh, The George M. Silliman Community Activity and Family Aquatic Center uh, is there. It's also just called the Silliman Center. And it has pools it has uh, a long lazy river pool and then it, like a water slide it, it, it's just a seems like a cool aquatic center some notable people from newark are bailey a professional wrestler who is the wwe's longest running smackdown women's champion also paul bostaff who used to be the drummer for slayer and uh, the comedian and actor Christopher Titus was born and raised in Newark. He had a show called Titus. I don't know. I n- recognized his face, but I'd never watched that show. You guys watch it? I actually did watch it. Really? It was pretty good. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I've seen him in, in stand-up a few times. Not, not live on stand-up, but, but Comedy Central used to run his specials a lot. It was like a 30-minute show? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a mid-90s, I think. It was kind of a big deal for a while. On a note about Slayer, this is a little uh, hint behind the curtain of California True Crime. Uh, believe it or not, Jessica is a big Slayer fan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's true, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Newark. Uh, that's a little background on the, on the city. Thank you. Uh, Gwen Amber Rose Arejo, whose birth name was Edward Arejo Jr., was born on February 24th, 1985 in Brawley, California, to Edward Arejo Sr. and Sylvia Guerrero. Now, Brawley is a small town about 26 minutes north of California, uh, north of the California-Mexican border. It's an agricultural town that has a population of about 23,000 residents. Brawley's large Hispanic community accounts for about 82% of the total population of the city. Gwen's parents would divorce when she was uh, around 10 months old. I couldn't find much mention of her father in the news accounts uh, or the reason for their divorce. Her mother would state later in interviews that even when she was very young, Gwen exhibited feminine traits and was not the quote-unquote typical boy. She even thought to herself that Gwen might be gay. Again, we're talking about a time not too long ago when the issue of transgender community was not publicly discussed. 
As Gwen would get older, she began to have more and more problems, struggling with her gender identity as well as the bullying and discrimination that she was facing when she was outside of the home. Add to this the impossibility of finding help in a small town, even one in the Bay Area at this time, and you might start to understand the pressure that Gwen was under. Finally, when Gwen was 14, she would come out to her mother and eventually soon after to the rest of her immediate family. It was then that she began to use the name Gwen, again mainly around family and close friends. She took this name because it was her favorite singer, Gwen Stefani. She would also go by the other names Wendy and uh, Lida. So do you know when they moved from Brawley up to Newark? It, it seemed like from what I read that Sylvia Guerrero, uh, Gwen's mom, talked about their move soon after the divorce. So I believe that the divorce kind of predicated her move. So I, I'm thinking around the time that Gwen was uh, a year old. You had also asked me to look up some information on what it's like for young kids who are going through um, what Gwen went through. I did that. And what I found is that it's really a complicated issue, depending on who you are and your different families. So we will put a list of organizations on our website. I think that's kind of a better idea. So that if people are having questions or they want to find someone they can talk to or either other families who can support them, they can do so. What I did find really interesting is that this kind of thing that Gwen was going through where she's discovering herself and choosing a name uh, is really common. But that it's actually something every child goes through. All of us, when we grow up, are learning to express ourselves and learning what gender means, not just biologically or to us and in our families, but also societally. And so all of the expressions children have, what they want to wear, where they go, it can be all over the place. And I know parents really worry for whatever reason. Um, But the one thing I saw that should make families feel better, I think, because the world is so terrible, which we're going to talk about in a minute, is that across the board, people, including transgender people in the survey that I looked at, who had supportive families, were less likely to report negative experiences related to a whole host of things. So including economic stability, health, mental health, psychological stress. They had less trouble dealing with the world around them. Um, And I think it's because they had a soft place to go, people who accepted them and cared for them. So I found that really encouraging, I think, because it's something a lot of parents can do. And I think that's one of the tragedies of this story that we'll, as we go along, I think you'll, you'll find is that, you know, Gwen, Gwen comes out as, as transgender to her family at 14 And has the strength and the self-possessiveness to start to really figure out who she is. And and her family, and I'm 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 sure her family uh, publicly is super supportive, but I can only imagine the struggles that they themselves are going through to to try to wrap their minds around this change in their family. But to see what will eventually happen to her while she has the support of family is is a terrible, terrible tragedy. And so then thinking about some of these statistics that we'll continue to kind of go back to to give you context for the story of those other individuals that don't have that same kind of support is staggering. Yeah, according to that same study, which I really urge everyone to go and look at it, I learned so much just reading it, and it actually has a breakdown by state. So you can see in California how these statistics line up nationally, um, as well as whatever state that you're in. But when it comes to letting families know there were still a lot of issues, one in 12 transgender individuals who had told their families were actually kicked out of the house, one in 10 suffered violence by a family member, But actually, I was kind of surprised 60% who were out to their families said that they were generally supportive. And I think especially now there seems to be a lot more um, organizations and groups who can help families deal with this kind of stuff. I can't imagine what it was like for Gwen's family. Uh, You hope that there was those kind of services, but I think that's why it's so important to support those in our communities and make sure we're doing whatever we can because it really does make a difference. And being supportive is a really big deal because according to the 2015 survey, uh, violence is a huge issue, but also with psychological distress. 40% of the respondents in that survey survey had attempted suicide in their lifetime, and that's nine times the rate of the U.S. population as a whole. So experiencing violence is an issue. It's definitely an issue in this story we're going to tell you, but it's 
also something we can do something about just by being more supportive. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. It's me, CJ, host of Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBT. I have sprinkled myself with protective glitter and jumped upon my trusty unicorn to bring stories of the LGBTQI. Whether you belong to this community or not, I welcome you to take a listen to Beyond the Rainbow. I have all sorts of crazy, chilling, and horrifying stories I tell. It's available almost everywhere you listen to podcasts. Still not sure I'm worth a listen? Then check out my website at beyondtherainbowpodcast.com. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. So it was about this time, uh, around age 14, when Gwen's actually going to leave school completely and go on independent study. I couldn't find an actual source that would detail the, the specific reason why. Um, usually what happens when a student leaves school to attend an independent study, um, the parents have to give a reason why, and that was not reported in the media. Uh, but I don't think it, it would come as any shock that it, that it was probably due to the bull- bullying that she was experiencing while at school. Eventually, by 2002 and 2003 school year, she would actually leave school altogether. In fact, after Gwen's murder, they will talk to the superintendent of the school district where she attended. He was quoted in an article in the Californian, a Berkeley newspaper, as saying, quote, He was a rather non-aggressive individual. I have heard that he did like women's clothing over men's, unquote. Which just again shows the fact that, that at that time, the idea of dead naming uh, a transgender in, in person. And again, when we use the term dead naming, that means using a transgender man or woman's name that they no longer use. I think it's going off of this quote, it's 2002. And I mean, I don't know who the superintendent is, but in his mind, transgender means clothing. It means fashion. Like that's, that's the only thing he, yeah. he quotes about is, oh, clothes. <laughs> so. Right. And you, you would hope that, that you're, you're basically the leader of a, a entire school district and one of your students was brutally murdered. You would hope that the person would reach out to the parents or the family to, to know a little something more other than what the hearsay or, or what the rumor, what the rumor was. He's a non-aggressive individual. Again, that's just like who describes somebody as a, a non-aggressive individual. Right. I also think it's really important because I know we're talking about 2002, but these are some of the same issues I'm hearing from people today, from families and young people and teachers who are working with people, with kids who are coming out as trans and suffering some of these same indignities in school, really, being kind of bullied by teachers or dead naming. I, I know at least one teacher, I don't know that personally, a story of one teacher who refused to use that the student's preferred pronouns and name in class. And so I think these are still, as much as this is a long time ago, very big issues for now. Yeah. I think public awareness is more, but, I, but, I, but we're still dealing with the idea of public acceptance. And I agree. I think we see these problems in schools uh, a lot more than maybe is even reported because in order for it to be reported, the child has to report to their parents or their loved ones or a school official. And if the school official, and that's not saying all school officials are, are bullying trans students, but you know, some of the bullying does go on by adults as well as a lot of it going on by, by students. And it can be a, a horrible isolating thing then to turn around and try, who are you going to tell, especially if you're in an environment where your parents or your family may not be as accepting. So again, we go back to the idea that a, a uh, an accepting and understanding environment can be the best defense against, you know, terrible things possibly happening. This quote to me also really highlights something that's going to come out in every episode. I think that a lot of what happens to Gwen is done because people use something about her to stop seeing her as a person. Mm-hmm. And this quote, I mean, already, and it's already in the newspaper, they know what's happened to her. And this is the first thing someone goes to. It's kind of the same treatment of not seeing someone as a person, not even having a, that's terrible or mm-hmm. that kind of effect. This is the first 
kind of thought in their mind, which tells right. you something about how they saw her as well. And this will this will go to questions that we we as we talk about this. And I know this is a lot of build up for this case, but I think when when we were laying this out and writing this episode, I'll, we felt that it was important that we get a lot of this out in the first episode to, to lay the groundwork for as we we go along because there this is not um, this is a harder case to talk about. And so we want to make sure that we're doing it again with the reverence it deserves, and because it's not our story, we're we're you know we're not part of of that community, but we under we want to be sensitive to those struggles and and do the best best possible job about reporting these things. Now, in fact, according to a television program called uh, Fatal Encounter Season One, Episode Eight, which I did find uh, for free this time, I did not have to pay for a terrible <laughs> television episode. Um, and actually, uh, it is available online. I will link this episode on our website because I think it did some things well. It, 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 other things are kind of exa- over exaggerated, but that's that's a lot of episodes we talk about. Gwen's actually denied the ability to use the women's restroom or locker room. And that's one of the that's one of the, the the preceding factors to her going on independent study, and that's again a show of the systematic discrimination that she was facing. I couldn't find any mention of this in any other media sources, so I, I didn't want to I don't want to say that's a an actual hundred percent fact, but according to this particular source, that's one of the reasons that will um, precipitate her going on independent study. Uh, Gwen's sister Pearl would eventually say that by eighth grade, the bullying had gotten to such a level that Gwen couldn't handle it. And this would lead her to finally leaving regular school and then again, continuing on independent study and eventually leaving school altogether. And so this is another example of her, even though she has a supportive family, the larger society that she's exposed to being that kind of harsh environment is not accepting and not tolerant is causing her to to give up on her educational pursuits at that time which we know can have huge huge detrimental effects on on young people so when we talk about bullying we're not just talking and we've said this a little bit we're not just talking about being bullied by peers but really being bullied by the larger establishment i.e i.e the schools businesses and things like that um, according to uh, a study 59 percent of trans students when surveyed were denied the use of bathrooms that conformed to their gender identity so which is going to lead to even more problems when dealing with, with out of school so this kind of discrimination is is really covered under Title IX of schools that protects against sex discrimination, or at least should, but it's not always enforced. A little bit more info on this type of bullying that goes on. Now, in uh, 2014, the Metro Youth Chances Project uh, surveyed more than 7,000 young people, including 956 trans young people, and they found the following statistics. of trans people said that they were experiencing name-calling, and 35% had experienced some kinds of physical attacks. Now, this is happening at schools or around schools. Almost a third, 32% of trans young people, say that they've missed lessons due to discrimination or fear of discrimination. Over a quarter, 27% of trans young people of this surveyed group had attempted suicide. Again, what we talked about earlier when, when Jessica was going over those statistics. So th- this this shows that, but and this is all should be covered under Title IX. Now, Sean, you had a little bit of backstory on what Title IX is for those people that aren't familiar. Yeah, like myself, I I've heard the term and a lot of things we just don't know about and. I I don't know a lot of things, so I like to ask questions or look things up. And Title IX was one of those, but it was uh, Title IX was part of the education amendments uh, that were signed in on June twenty third, nineteen seventy two, by actually President Nixon. And um, it was what it felt like was more towards sports at the time. But what it says in Title IX, it says no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex, be excluded from participating in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And this is from the U.S. Department of Education's page. But, like, back then, a lot of it was around, um, like, women's sports. They didn't get scholarships and stuff like that. And this was equal rights kind of in that. And then... 
men were really scared <laughs> and they like tried to do the tower amendment which it it really didn't bother college sports you know like spreading out scholarships and stuff like that but we kind of had a, uh, us three had a discussion about how it's kind of like the living document style you were using a term that i couldn't understand like we were talking about um how title nine is written that it it can be fluid to go to with uh ch- trans rights well the yeah and i think that's that's the issue is that this 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 ti- this title this law is enacted but it's because so much of education is left up it's funded federally but so much of education is left up to the state to decide how those laws are enacted that one of the things with title 9 is then it becomes interpreted by the individual states and school districts within that state so while the spirit of it is that every child deserves an education and that every child deserves equal access to any program on a school. And like you said, um, it started out as sports, but when it, with that, that idea of any educational program is expansive, but it's up to those people that are, that are interpreting it to put that kind of basically put their money where their mouth is and make sure that those things are enforced. And what these statistics are showing is that, that that's not enforced, that these things aren't enforced. And, and this is from 2014. Mm Mm-hmm. I actually have a lot of experience with Title IX, unfortunately, um, not good experience. And um, one of the things I can tell you is that it's still, as you're saying, it's not enforced. And one of the big problems is though the Department of Education can open up an inquiry into a certain school, it doesn't often do so. There's a lot of focus on colleges as opposed to public schools, high schools and things like that. And so colleges and high schools are still getting away with a ton of unequal treatment towards their students and women in particular. The other thing is that schools have been very smart about finding loopholes in order to keep that mistreatment going. So I think things are better than they were, but they're still very bad, actually. I I was just looking at statistics the other day that over 50% of colleges are nowhere near um, being in full compliance with this law. And the hard thing for someone who is transgender or anyone in a small town I found this hard for myself, is that when you want to go to force the issue, the thing that you are most likely have to do is bring a lawsuit. And that is a lot of responsibility on a child. Even if you have a supportive family, it's still, you know, you're going to experience a ton of bullying. I know I did, which was very frustrating, often from adults. And you won't be accepted. People in town might spurn you. It's a really difficult thing to do. And so if, if Gwen wants to use the restroom, which I think we can all say for any child in school is a pretty simple ask, schools could be able to just change the rules a little bit so that, you know, normal human thing can happen during the day and they don't, she can sue. But it is a ton of responsibility. It's going to cost the family money. It's just, it's an overwhelming thing to try and change a system. And it is especially hard on kids. And a lot of times what you see is you see what happens to Gwen is a student that's bullied, that has, that may have a supportive family, but because of the system that's arrayed against her, the easiest, the path of least resistance, and understandably so. Here's a 14, 15-year-old girl who, who's already dealing with everything else associated with being a teenager in high school and early adolescence, on top of which she's dealing with everything else that's going on with her transitioning and s- systemic sexism and, and discrimination, and you're going to ask her to go against the school. Well, w- what happens? She goes on an independent study. It's the path of least resistance, and I don't think anybody could blame her for that. You know, it, 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 it takes her out of that system, but then what happens is then that almost allows the system off the hook because, well, the problem's dealt with. See, we don't have an issue anymore because the student is, is home, and, that, and that's, to me, that's the insidious part of it. And you're probably not experiencing a lot of support elsewhere. So you don't really feel, I mean, it would be so easy, I would think, or not easy, but incumbent upon a teacher whose job is to protect every student there to try and change, to try and support, say, we can help you, we'll figure this out. I mean, so much of high school and elementary school and, oh my gosh, junior high is just like, how are we getting through this? Mm -hmm. And you're just trying to kind of stay under the radar, really. And then now you're asked, you're already being bullied by your peers, you're being bullied by adults, and now you're asked to try and change how everyone thinks about this. 
it's a lot. And I think it sticks with people because in the statistics I looked up, this particular issue with not being able to use a restroom seems to be a common experience in particular to transgender people. 59% of them said that they avoided using a public restroom anywhere in the world just because you might get harassed, uh, you might be asked to leave, you don't know how people are going to respond. 32% of transgender individuals in that study said they limited how much they ate or drank just to avoid using a restroom during the day. That's at work, that's at school, that's at home, that's just when you're out in the world. And 8% reported having illnesses because of not using the bathroom. I mean, this is a normal human thing. It's dangerous to not eat or drink or to not be able to go to the restroom. It causes medical issues. And yet it's unfortunately, and I think just listening to the news sometimes, it's the most common thing you're going to hear right. people talk about and complain about. And, and it's, it's, it's so weird because it's not... I I mean, maybe it's just me, but I've never thought about when I use the restroom, it's a turn on to, to go in there. I don't no. Uh, you know, I most of the time, even like at like a rest stop where there if it's a urinal with absolutely no blockage, I don't see anything. I don't understand why it's that big of a deal. A lot of this when we talk about this when we went over this episode, you and I, Charles, a lot of this seems like it is really based in just terrible stereotypes, mm -hmm. gender stereotypes, traditional ones about men and women. And I could talk all day, obviously, if you've listened to this podcast about women's issues, but some of those stereotypes about men just being right. like, oh, people are going to use the restroom. Obviously, men are going to hurt people. <laughs> right. That's disgusting. The, the predatory idea. nature of men. Yeah. Who do you know? Why? That's terrible, sexist idea of what men are like. And I want to I want to go back on touch before we continue on. And and again, to you know, there's a if you've listened to our episodes before, if this is your first episode of California True Crime, welcome. But if if it's not, then you know that we we spend a lot of time going over these the history and the and setting the stage. And and this is an important part of this case because as we'll get into it, the the issues of why Gwen is murdered deals with her as a person and and her identity as a trans woman but i do want to touch base before we move on on that idea of bullying from school officials and and teachers specifically when we use the term bullying we're not it's not always cognitive or cognitive or or bullying that we may think of as name calling or pointing out or 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 intentionally treating the child badly a lot of times what's perceived as bullying from the child can be something as simple as not understanding what the what the child is going through and not having the tools necessary to deal with a child who's going through something that you yourself may never be able to, to comprehend. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed too is that our schools um, by and large are woefully unprepared and understaffed to help kids that need better counseling. Um, uh, I've had the experience of working with uh, school counselors in the past that are amazing individuals, but they are very overworked and underpaid and understaffed. And who's to say that with with help, Gwen wouldn't have been able to stay in school with with a more supportive environment like that. So I, I don't I don't want to those of you listening. I don't want to make a thing. We're just we're bashing on the schools and saying that they're the reason to blame. It's a it's a symptom of a much larger problem that, that there isn't an easy answer to. And so that's really what we're talking about. This is the world that Gwen is trying to escape when she retreats to her family. This this constant bombardment of struggling with who she is and and finding out really as as she she grows up is into the woman that she she will that she wants to be. And it seems though as a family is supportive or or at least is really trying to make Gwen as comfortable as possible. We have some photos that we're going to be posting up on our website where you see the family pulling around and it, it, it seems as a very loving family and, and very supporting, but understand they're also dealing with a lot. You know, there, there's a radical shift in their family and um, it involves w one of their loved ones. And you have to remember that this is happening uh, around 1999. She, she comes out to her parent, to, to her family, her, her mom and her family as uh, a trans woman in 1999. It's not going to be for 16 more years before Caitlyn Jenner becomes one of, if not the most well-known transgender woman at the time due to her appearance on reality TV. 
gay marriage was still illegal in the United States at this time. Uh, this was 1999. Bill uh, Clinton was president of the United States. Nabster is still a thing and was being sued uh, for copyright infringement. The transgender movement did not even really have the visibility or the growing acceptance that it's struggling with now uh, in 2020. And this was only two years after the Ellen DeGeneres, after Ellen DeGeneres came out on her TV sitcom, the original sitcom. Uh, the one that before she became the huge powerhouse of daytime television and, and the Ellen show. Uh, it was also the same year as Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace came out in theaters. This is the world, again, that Gwen and her family are trying to navigate. She's a young woman that is trying to deal with her own life and the expectations of her family and really trying to discover the young woman that she's becoming. And amidst all of it, she's dealing with the prejudice and bigotry of the world and what society would throw at her. This was the world that would often find young people struggling with depression, drug addiction, and suicide, as Jessica talked about earlier. For Gwen, it was not different. As time went on, Gwen's mother noticed that her daughter struggled with both alcohol and drugs. Again, this behavior is not out of the blue. A lot of people will turn to substance abuse when dealing with stress, and the type of stress that Gwen was going through must have been absolutely tremendous. But the fact is that substance abuse is higher for trans teens than any other subgroup of teens. In the article from the Journal of Adolescent Health entitled Transgender Youth Substance Use Disparities Results from a Population-Based Sample, teens that struggle with gender identity issues are between 2.5 and 4 times more likely to have problems with substance abuse. This coupled with a higher rate of early onset abuse means that those teens that are dealing with stress and abuse by self-medicating which is not only dangerous in and of itself, but can potentially lead to teens to putting themselves in situations that that they would not normally be in. What do you mean by early onset abuse? So the difference is, and in the study they talk a lot about the difference between abuse of substances and early onset would be preteen. So they talked a little bit about even as early as nine or 10 year olds dealing with medication or uh, prescription drugs, uh, you know, uh, alcohol abuse. And then, and then how many of those, how many of those continued the abuse on into their, to their adolescence and um, adulthood. According to her friend, Chrissy Blanchett, who was really close to Gwen during this time, the two would often go into San Francisco looking for parties and older men to buy them beer. Chrissy reports that the two would go into the city at night and look for parties. She said that Gwen and her would be able to reinvent themselves in the city away from their own town. Now, as Sean talked about, Newark is not that far from San Francisco. And so a lot of time this will be reported in various newspapers that Gwen was living her life with uh, with expressing risky behavior. And there's a lot of early articles that express the same sentiment, that she's risking her life by going into the city and, and carousing with older men and, and looking for, you know, getting drunk and taking drugs and things like that. And I really argue that Gwen's really trying to deal with her, de- her real development into a person that she's becoming, and she's struggling with that. And I would further argue that she's not doing anything that a lot of us didn't do when we were young growing up into the people that we're going to become a lot of us that grew up in small towns next to and i know the the three of us did i grew up in a small town that was next to a larger town we spent a lot of time not going to someplace else where you didn't have family looking over your shoulder where you could do stupid things i mean i i would consider that most of us put ourselves and or our friends in situations that looking back as adults were dumb things to do or, or quote unquote risky situations. But that's part of being a kid or, or, or a young person. You make those mistakes in order to grow out of them. I feel like it's a lot of, it sounds like a lot of victim blaming mm-hmm. in the newspapers, especially for something like you're saying. I mean, it's really common for adults to tell young people, high schoolers, junior high to like slow down, you know, because we know now that you can't get that time back. It's okay to be a kid. But I would think the appeal of being an adult is especially big for someone who's never really had the sort of the privilege of having a safe childhood. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it seemed as Gwen's family is very supportive, but they're also very protective. And so I know growing up in a large family that my family is very protective. It can sometimes it can feel as an adolescence of almost a feeling of stifling. And so that ability to like shed that 
those of all of the crap that's going on at home or, or you know, if you're you're having trouble with your family or what's going on at school and then slipping out and then going out with your friends on a Friday or Saturday night and cruising up and down the, the highway or, or looking for a party or getting somebody's older brother to buy you beer or something like that, hanging out in a park, you know, uh, that has a certain allure because you're you're getting to reinvent yourself a little bit. It definitely does not make it your fault that you were murdered. No, and I think this goes back to a lot. Of what, and we're going to constantly kind of hammer away at this nail too. And this goes back to something that that we've talked a lot about in in previous episodes. Um, but and I believe uh, Sean, you brought it up when we talked about the pure victim. Is that it? Uh, most of the articles that you'll read, and again, we'll put the the work cited page on our website so you can check those some of those out for yourself. But none of the articles talk about her in this respect. She's 17 years old and very few of the early articles comment on the fact that she's a child. Um, and I think that's criminal in, in and of itself. Um, we will talk about some of the better reporters, one specifically from um, the East Bay Times that does a great job covering the, covering the case. But um, a lot of the article articles almost well, I won't say almost. They do. They, they, they victim blame Gwen for what happened to her. Now, Chrissy goes on to state that they had, they talked sometimes about what they were going to do and how it could be considered dangerous. So Chrissy will say, yeah, they, they've had that. Like a lot of us did, again, as kids, we talk about maybe what we're doing is not necessarily the safest thing. But they always believe that they'd be able to handle it. Again, I don't see that as that out of character for any 16 or 17-year-old kid, you know. They always believe that they can get out of any scrape that they get into. Unfortunately, this, however, is going to be shown not to be the case. In fact, Gwen's mom will at one time have to rescue her from a party where Gwen had been confronted and threatened about being transgender. Her mom was able to get there and get her out in time before anything really escalated, but it would cast a shadow going forward on eventually what's going to lead to Gwen's death. Remember that this is all happening in the Bay Area, close in the shadow of the San Francisco. That's where the girls would go and slip off and, and look for parties and, and try to get um, people to buy them alcohol. It's important to understand that to outsiders, the Bay Area can, can be a place of acceptance and understanding for all people, no matter where they are from or, or who they are. It has certainly not been the case for most of the history of the region. What acceptance the LGBTQIA community has gotten has come after a long and ongoing struggle, and, and sometimes that can be forgotten. And in fact, a lot of the murders, when we looked up other murders of transgender people, had happened in San Francisco and the larger Bay Area. We'll also talk a lot about that even in 2002, there isn't a lot of outreach programs that would help somebody like Gwen come to terms with what's going on, there are not a lot of... Now, eventually, there will be more, um, but the sad fact is that most of them will come after after Gwen's murder. It, it's weird just to think of 2002 being less than 20 years ago, and it was a completely different time. I remember it was around 2002 because of a certain cell phone I had. I was in the Bay Area on Haight Street, and I think I called someone, and this is like old beginning of cell phone style, and some lady on hate, we don't have cell phones on hate straight, and started like yelling <laughs> at me. It's just like, it's only 18 years ago, and it's a completely different time. So, And I think that's why we really wanted to spend so much time going over this for the, and it's really this first episode, is to, is to set the stage for what will happen. Because I think sometimes, I, I know... When I initially read the, the, the court records for what goes on and how Gwen's murdered, it shocked me. Like, well, that, you know, I can't believe, you know, when was this case? And then you look at, oh, it's 2002. That's not that far ago. And that trans panic defense, and, and again, we're throwing these terms out and we will go over all of them. But that trans panic defense of the defendants was actually used like it was with a straight face their lawyer said that it was it was understandable that these men killed this woman because she was a trans woman and that that was an acceptable defense in 2002 and like you said Sean that's 18 years ago that that just blew my mind but again that also shows that the I will say the sheltered life I've lived cuz not having to face a lot of that myself so 
the this the the events of the story, the events of this crime take place in late summer of two thousand two. Uh, it's going to be the the last summer of Gwen's life, and this is in August. Gwen's going to find herself in the company of Jason Caceres, Michael Magson, Jose Morel, and Jaron Neighbors. She would meet them on one of her outings with Chrissy to San Francisco, and would continue to hang out with them for the next couple of months until her death. She would introduce herself as Lita. She would continue to use this name when she was interacting with the men and their social group. Again, we talked a little bit about earlier about the the idea that as she's transitioning, as she's kind of developing into the woman that she's going to become, she's trying on different names. I also understand the idea of I'm leaving my family behind. I'm going to leave my name my family calls me to, to assume another name when I go somewhere else. You know, I mean... We've all told stories when we went out that may not necessarily. I myself have occasionally told a story or two, you know, to try to reinvent yourself when you're away from home because it's fun. It's different. I have to say there were probably a couple times we would give a different name. I think uh, one or two of my friends, we had um, some difficulties when you gave your real name, especially when the internet started to come into thing, and someone would find you and kind of bother you or not not stalk you necessarily, mm-hmm. but call you over and over and over again. So sometimes it was just easier to just go out unbothered and, and just be someone else for a little bit. Witnesses will testify that she did engage in drinking and marijuana use during this time, which again, I'll interject. We, we've said this quite a bit, but I, I want to make this completely clear. This is something that a lot of young people do when they're hanging out, but it will be brought up again and again in the reporting. It's almost like they were they were giving it as a possible reason that the murder took place. Again, like Jessica, you said, it's victim blaming. Well, and it's interesting because we obviously haven't gone over the case yet, but it's a lot of the same behaviors that the murderers are participating in, and yet it's not used in that same way. Right, right. And and so, again, that's a, that's a form of discrimination against the, the murder victim. There's a port that, was, that uh, was also at this time that Gwen would experiment with crystal meth. This was from an interview that her mother would do, um, but I didn't find any other mention of it from another source. Um, her mother would say that her use of this particular drug would send Gwen over the deep end, and her problems during this time were becoming more and more extreme. Again, I couldn't find any other uh, uh, report of her using meth. Uh, her friends hadn't mentioned it, but I do want to mention it because, again, this could be an indication of her trying to deal with, with a, uh, a deeper depression. Now, Jason Caceres, who's 22 years old, Michael Magson, also 22, and Jose Morel, 24 years old, had been friends since they were very, very young. According to Yomi Rong, a reporter of the Mercury Daily News, they were often referred to as the Three Musketeers or sometimes even the Three Stooges because they were inseparable. Little League, school, friends, vacations, these kids always hung out together. And sometime before the the summer of 2002, the group of friends would become acquainted with Jaron Neighbors, who was a 19-year-old college student at the time. It would be reported often in different media sources that Jaron Neighbors was, quote-unquote, the weak link in the group. He, it stated in a few of the, the newspaper articles, was constantly trying to prove himself to the group. It's also stated that he had a tendency to tell a lot of stories and a uh, constantly tried to prove himself that he was just as tough as the rest of the guys and he put on this kind of macho persona so again this kind of goes back to what you were talking about jessica is this is this preconceived notion of what uh um, men are supposed to be like and jaron is is he's a little younger um the other guys are, are, are already in the workforce and things like that um jaron's still in school and so he's trying to act tough to 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 hang around these guys and this would also play a large role in bringing Gwen's killers to justice, Jaron's kind of uh, the act that he puts on. The group would spend a lot of time, especially during the summer of 2002, when they weren't working or at school at a rented house uh, of Jose and his older brother, Paul's, in Newark, California. The two brothers were living in the house that was owned by their parents, who also paid most of the rent and, and the bills for the for the place. So so again, these guys are all working. They have discretionary income, and they're living in a house that's rented to them by their parents. So this becomes it's easy to understand that this becomes kind of party central for for this group. 
And in general, in the last few months, this is where everybody comes to hang out. And when I say everybody, um, there are different reports about how many people would really congregate at this house. But I'm assuming that this is a place that you – and we all have kind of had those experiences where you knew the house to go to, where it was – there was always something going on. Or, you know, on the weekends, it was there was always a party going on. And after their first meeting with Gwen late in August, she would too be, would become a, a regular fixture at the house and, and also at these parties. Uh, these also, there were also others that had attended these parties, Jose's younger brother, Emmanuel, and Paul's girlfriend, Nicole Brown, uh, would also become witnesses to the event that would take place eventually in late October. In fact, Nicole Brown and Gwen, who had become friendly early on, will have an altercation a few weeks before the murder takes place. It seems that the group, again, was at the house of Jose and Paul. They were drinking and, as some reports had said, smoking marijuana. It was then that Gwen began to dance on the table, uh, being the center of attention. Now, Chrissy, her friend, uh, who would accompany her to some of these parties, would, would, uh, would later say, um, and she wasn't at this particular event, but would say that there were times when Gwen really enjoyed being the center of attention. Again, this she's hanging out with these guys. Uh, they're drinking. She gets up on the table and starts dancing. And she, again, she's dealing with a lot of stuff. She comes to a place where the people don't necessarily know her. They don't know what's going on in her background. So she can kind of cut loose and be her, be herself. Now, she's working on trying to figure out who she was. And now these people are paying a lot of attention to her. And they're seeing who, they're seeing her as she sees herself. Not like what was happening with what was going on in school or even with her family. Again, remember, she's not trying to pretend to be a girl. She's not trying to deceive this, these guys. And that's the defense that's going to be later used. She is a girl. She's trying to understand how to move in a world and gain acceptance in a world as a woman that's constantly pushing back against her. So at this party, she's dancing on this table. She's being egged on by the guys around her. There's alcohol. There's drugs involved. And it was then that Nicole Brown interceded, intercedes. Now, the uh, reporter Yomi Rong reports that, in, in again, reports in the Mercury Daily News, that Nicole Brown is going to become annoyed at Gwen, who is going by uh, Lita, but we're going to continue to call her Gwen. And she's annoyed because she's getting all the attention. Nicole had been kind of the center of female attention for the group, and now suddenly some, somebody's coming in and kind of supplanting her. Nicole tells Gwen to get down. Gwen refuses. Nicole then gets grabby and tries to pull her down, and this led to the two women getting into a fight. Nicole pulls Gwen down off the table and starts pushing her around. Gwen will fight back and hits Nicole and puts her on the ground. The others that were there were comment later after the fight that Gwen's strength far outmatched Nicole's, even though Nicole was physically larger than Gwen. This would lead to a few of the guys to joke if it was possible that Gwen was actually a man. Though no thought was made really to the joke, um, most of them laughed it off. But this altercation was one of the first stepping stones on the events that would lead to October 3rd, 2002, which we'll get to in the next episode. We thank you for listening. Uh, Jessica and Sean, do you have any final thoughts? I don't think so. No, it's... There'll be plenty of thoughts once we get into the next episode, I think. <laughs> and we thank you for, for listening to this episode, dealing with the backstory and, and Gwen's early life. Again, we want to make sure that we're, we're doing right by her and, and by others that are dealing with the same kind of issues or might be, might be experiencing some of the same troubles. So tonight, Jessica's going to be going over the cold case for this episode. On July 13th, 2020... Marilyn Caceres, 22 years old, of Brawley, California, was found dead at 8.30 a.m. by firefighters that were responding to a fire near an abandoned house in the 1100 block of Main Street. Caceres' body was found when the house was checked due to its closeness to the fire. Her death is considered a homicide, but there has been no suspects reported as of yet, nor a motive for Marilyn's murder. Her family will point to her being a trans woman of color as the reason for her murder. Police will not comment on the cause of her death. It's been reported that there was trauma to Marilyn with no signs of gunfire. Marilyn Caceres had been out for about five years as a trans woman. Aubrey Caceres, Marilyn's younger brother, would say, quote, He was my big brother. She became my big sister later on, but she was my big brother in my heart. 
Aubrey will tell a story of Marilyn punching someone that was bullying Aubrey. He describes his sister as someone that dealt with bullying, with optimism, and a confidence that she would carry on into her adulthood. She loved to play baseball and basketball, but an attention deficit disorder had a damaging effect on her schooling and eventually would prompt her to drop out of high school. She wanted to become a registered nurse despite the setback, just like others in her family. She was a woman that dealt with drug addiction and lived on and off the streets. Marilyn would often say, when offered help by family, that the streets were where she felt accepted. Aubrey Caceres called Marilyn's killing, quote, a hateful thing to do, and said she deserves justice. What happened was a tragedy. If you have any information on the murder of Marilyn Caceres, call the Brawley Police Department at 760-344-2111. If you or somebody you love is dealing with issues related to being trans, there are people who can help. Contact the National Center for Transgender Equality. They have a wealth of resources and numbers of people who can help with all sorts of issues, including health care, insurance, legal issues, immigration, and international resources. They even have a Veterans Affairs Division. We'll be posting these links and more on our website at CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. Take the time to reach out and help end the hate and bigotry. Thank you for listening to the first part of The Murder of Gwen Orejo. Don't forget to rate us and review our podcasts on platform of your choice. It really does help get the word out. As always, you can visit us on Twitter or an Instagram or Facebook at Cali True Crime, as well as join our Facebook group at California True Crime. Take a look at our website, CaliforniaTrueCrime.com, which has our blog as well as a new store where you can get some Cali True Crime merch for your friends or family, coworkers, and people that you don't know also just plain strangers <laughs> we also have our patreon page up and running with levels for every budget uh, this is also a huge way that you can support the show and help us bring you the episodes and the research that you have come to ex- expect we'd also like to thank our quality control Doné Melanie Duncan this has been recorded at Snail Ranch Studios and TBD Studios and this is a production of Way Grimace.